So I'm joined today by uh, David C. Smalley. He's a comedian, an actor, uh, a voice actor, a podcast host, an author, uh, and he loves to have conversations with people that disagree with him. Um, I actually first heard about him uh, about his when he was doing a podcast called Dogma Debate. Uh, he was participating in a charity event. I think it was... I want to say it was uh, the vulgarity for charity thing, like you were you were brought in to do like three or four reads on, on that. But that's how I had uh, had heard about you, uh, and also my introduction to modest needs. And ever since then, I've actually been a monthly contributor. Anyone who's not should uh, should go to modestneeds.org and, and consider that uh, it's worth your time. Uh, but that being said, I know that at the time he was hosting Dogman Debate, uh, and I think it was hosted on iHeartRadio. Um, and I know you've done recording and production work for audiobooks, um, and you're now branching into uh, comedy and acting. Uh, so, man, you got you got irons and all the fires, basically. Uh, so that's that's why I wanted to have you on because you got a lot of unique perspectives. So, Dave, uh, David, thank you for joining me. And how are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm good, man. This is, and you're right. All of those things, you're spot on. Those things I've been doing, and I think having a good basic understanding of some level of production i think almost everybody's starting to figure out now that you can do this stuff at home yeah but 11 12 13 years ago when i first dipped my toe in this stuff it wasn't so readily available and the equipment wasn't so user friendly and everything mm -hmm. was either consumer grade low quality or you had to go full-on production mode in your home and dedicate an entire room and insulate everything i mean it was so much more complicated and mm -hmm. you know now you know it's easier to get an understanding but you still have to have a good understanding of some of the stuff in order to put out a good product so over the years of putting out content uh i've 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 had to wrap my head around you know audio engineering audio editing completely self-taught i never went to anything formal but man will you know being thrown into the fire of live radio, live mm -hmm. television, running sound boards as a backup for someone else. That'll, that'll teach you some stuff, you know? And so, yeah, I've, I've had a blast learning and, and getting involved. This is the first interview I've ever done, by the way, having to do with something outside of all the other things I do. And I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. I want you to know that. Well, I'm glad. Um, you know, I have, uh, I've done my very best to try to come up with a series of questions that, uh, that you probably haven't been asked a thousand times before. Uh, which hopefully will make it a little bit more enjoyable for you. Um, but actually, uh, to jump right in, I, I, you were a drummer for your church growing up. I, I played guitar for my church growing up um, a, as a kid, and that's how I got my first introduction to like live sound. And you know, one day the the audio guy didn't show up, and they were like, "Daniel, can you run the mixing uh, tonight?" And it was you know. Um, uh, trial by fire, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. Was that your introduction as well to audio? Um, no. Uh, I, I, so this is a funny story. I was in, God, I was 14 years old. Um, I think it was in eighth grade. And I was at something called Mayfest with my mom. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or if you've ever been a part of anything it's like Oktoberfest. you have these certain like seasonal festivals or whatever hmm. and i grew up in a small town called everman texas south of fort worth and somewhere around fort worth i think they had mayfest every year and i went with my mom to mayfest we we're walking around doing regular stuff i'd been begging her for a drum set for years because i'd been you know tapping on stuff getting in trouble at school for beating on desks and all that and i've been asking her for a drum set and just on a whim one day we're at Mayfest and my mom says to me there, we walk up to this karaoke stage and it's a huge stage and there's tons of people there. And she goes, if you get up there and sing achy breaky heart for me, I'll buy you a drum set. Achy breaky heart uh, from Billy Ray Cyrus. And, and I was like, she thought I wouldn't do it. And little did she know I did not give a single damn and I went up there, I signed my name up. They called me almost instantly. And I went up and I didn't just sing it. Like I, I threw down, like I was full into it, completely nice. on board. And then, I don't know, I just had a blast too. And I came down, she was blown away. She's like, oh my God, you didn't give a damn. And I was like, yeah, I want a drum set. <laughs> and within, within about, I guess a few months, because that was Mayfest. When I, when, when school ended, 
which would have been the end of May or early June, um, the last day of school, I, I had a drum set. It was a used $150 sort of piecemeal drum set that was like mm -hmm. gray and blue and, you know, just completely ragged out set. And I, 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 I got it and immediately I didn't need a lesson or anything. I knew exactly what to do. Everything fell into place. Really? It, yeah. I just completely, I, with, as soon as I sat down, I started playing beats just like I'd had lessons for years. It was so easy to me. And it was just so much fun. And so I played for probably 10 months, just kind of teaching myself at home. Mm -hmm. And my mom took me to a bar uh, one time. I'd, I'd been to bars early when I was younger, like five, six years old. She'd take me to a bar and we'd hang out. And then she'd take me home before it got really late. I know that sounds weird, but I literally grew up in a country Western bar. Like, huh. like, like it's not dancing. so weird for Texas. Yeah. Right. For, for right, minors right. But, to be allowed. But, but there's, yeah. my mom has pictures of me like, at five years old, dancing with thirty-year-old women, like on a dance floor in a in a in a, in a country bar, line dancing. And, uh, I'm just curious. That's oh, yeah, what I associate with the achy oh, breaky. Oh, I did all of it. I did all of it. I did, uh, <laughs> I did line dancing. I did two step, three step, yeah. four corner, freeze, shuffle, bus stop, all the dances. That, that's that's what I was doing. Nice. And then um, eventually, uh, just about ten months after I I'd, I'd gotten my first drum set one of the, the live bands that were playing that night during one of their breaks, I just went up and said, can I set in on the drums? I know a few songs. And I was like, I think I was 15 at this point. Mm -hmm. And the singer was like, you know how to play it? And I was like, yeah, I just started playing. I'd love to play uh, this song. And I think we played um, God Bless Texas, ah. which is uh, another country song, of course. And I played God Bless Texas. And actually before, before I sat down to play, as the drummer was handing me the sticks, he was kind of irritated that I was mm -hmm. there to play, I think. He hands me the sticks and he goes, make this kid play Wipeout. <laughs> and, and I didn't know what that was. I, I was, a, I mean, again, completely, you know, I didn't know what he was talking about. But I sat down to play. I played um, God Bless Texas. And I just kept remembering this song Wipeout that this drummer who was irritated with me wanted to set a bar so high or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I went home that night and I learned Wipeout. Yeah, I my mom had the tape. I, I taught myself the you know the the it's it's fairly easy for anyone. Yeah, it's it's yeah. super easy. But as a kid, you don't think about it. And then I thought, how terrible must that drummer be if he thinks Wipeout is actually a difficult song? I, to play? That's actually exactly what I was thinking. And yeah, and then, and then so I, I I learned that and was like, oh wow, maybe I'm you know maybe that guy maybe I'm a I'm, I'm closer to being on that level than I thought I was. Yeah. And sure enough, man, within just a few years, I was the drummer in a heavy metal band and. That sort of launched me. And as I was doing the heavy metal band, I played on the side for my church uh, oh, several okay. years into it. So I don't know. I would say not several years because I think I started probably around the age of 16 actually playing. So I'd only been playing for about a year and a half, two years before I started playing with my church and then also the heavy metal band at the same time. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then by then, by 2000, by the year 2000, I was the lead singer of a band. And we had a drummer, and I had like a small record deal and did some touring, and uh, that just launched me into radio, and then radio launched me into entertainment and voiceovers, and mm -hmm. here I am, you know, 20, 20 years later in L.A. doing TV shows, radio, podcasting, and stand-up comedy, so... So was the heavy metal band your intro into uh, into audio production at, at all, or uh, was it after that where like a, a radio show just kind of landed in your in your lap and you were like, okay, I guess I'll get to learn audio now? Yeah, it was it was actually I would say 2003. Um, there was uh, an internet radio station. They were called Musicians.net, and I think they still may exist. Mm -hmm. But it was called Musicians.net, and they had a, a big studio in Dallas where all these different people had these – it was basically like a rehearsal studio for bands. Mm -hmm. But but uh, they, they had like really cheesy like live streaming wrestling radio. Like that was the big thing they were known for. Mm -hmm. It was like WWE, blah, 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 blah. And, and occasionally they would bring in some of the rock bands that were practicing down the hall because you could rent out space you know, yeah. for your band. And um, – I, you know, I knew a few rappers and a few stand-up comedians in Dallas, and I had a co-host who was just, he was just really fun, My, a good friend who was really funny, and I was like, hey, dude, he's always high, always smoking weed, <laughs> and just so funny, but didn't really do anything, he uh -huh. just smoked weed and made jokes, and we've <laughs> all got that friend, right? 
<laughs> and I was like, you should be my co-host. Like, you should come make stuff funnier. And I brought him in the studio and approached them about doing a show. And when I started in 2003, I was 23 years old. We were doing live streaming internet radio. It was a radio <laughs> show with me and my co-host. And we were bringing in um, uh, unsigned rappers and comedians. And what we would do is we would play a clip from what they would do, like play a clip of the song. Mm -hmm. or we would play a clip of their stand-up. And then we would just roast them for how terrible they were. <laughs> like we would just, we hardly ever said anything nice. We just, basically you came on the show to be roasted. But the bonus was at the end of the month, I had a live show planned at this place. It was like a, it was like a catfish place that had a stage in the back. Okay. And, and we had connected with the local 97.9, uh, the beat, uh, the, the number one hip hop station in Dallas. We connected with them and started booking live events. And so the deal was, yeah, you came on my internet radio show and you got roasted, but then you got to perform for five minutes at the end of the month. So I would have one show a week, every Thursday, a two hour live stream. And then those four people would each get five minutes on the live show. If you were a comedian, you did five minutes of stand up. If you were a rapper, you got to do one song. And you, we would also do freestyle battles. People would come up and do freestyle battles, and then we would nice. judge who won. And it was so much fun. It was it was just an absolute blast. And that's what cut my teeth in audio production because, you know, I would be at home going, oh, man, I want those cool radio-sounding bumpers and the mm -hmm. voiceovers, and I don't have money to buy it to pay a voiceover guy, so let me do the voiceover and then change my voice. And I got into – I used SoundForge. I don't know if that I have still a thing. I have used SoundForge. I, I think wait, it does still exist. But yeah, Sony SoundForge. I mean, whatever the early versions were in like 2003, yeah. 2000. The Wave Hammer. You remember that effect? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know yeah. And then, So I, le I learned how to like crossfade and layer yeah. different tracks. And that's where I really cut my teeth in audio. And then I moved into. So essentially, from this perspective, I was doing live internet radio that would be archived mm -hmm. so you could go back and listen to my shows later which is a podcast yeah uh, but the word podcast didn't exist yet so i've literally right. been i've literally had a podcast since before podcast was a word the word was invented in 2004 mm -hmm. and so uh that's what we had in live internet radio that you could listen to later and nobody had a word for it was that David and Hiso, the show that I think I heard you mention in like your first or second episode of Don? So Bay? that's called Smalley and Hiso. So, um, Smalley and Hiso. Okay. So that was a guy named Todd Hiso. That Todd Hiso. No, that wasn't until 2010. Okay. 2009. So this was, this original show is called The Smalls and Ill Show. So S M A L L Z. <laughs> And ill is I L L. He went by illustrious. And of course, he was a rapper. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so the Smalls and Ill show. There's probably some clips out there somewhere. I could. I should probably dig through my old archives and see if I can find some stuff and play it on my show to kind of go back to my roots. But um, yeah, the Smalls and Ill show is where it all started as far as audio production goes. How was it yeah. taking live? You took live calls at one point on on those iHeartRadio shows. Is, is that true? Yeah, so so for the first four and a half years that I did the new show, when I started the show called Dogma Debate, it's essentially the same now, just a different name. Right. So I still say that's my show that I started in 2000. Uh, it started in 2010, Smalley and Hiso. It was actually Dogma Debate already. We changed it to Smalley and Hiso for about a year, went back to Dogma Debate. He stayed with me. Hiso stayed with me for about three months on the new show. And then he didn't like the content and, in fact, told me he thought it would never actually be successful. Uh, and he he quit. Good read. And, and <laughs> shortly after, shortly after this, by 2013, I was, I, you know, I was paying my bills full time and ended up yeah. uh, moving to L.A. in 2016, you know, and whatever. But anyway, but by, within about two years of him telling me it was too small of a niche and it would never, never kick off. I was, I, we'd worked together and I resigned from my job, uh, to go do this full time. That was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I haven't talked to him a lot since, but I have no malice. He's a great dude. And I, I'd put him on the air in a second if he ever wanted to do a show. Um, but yeah, um, I, uh, it, around 2000. So when I first started that, that level of the show, I was on blog talk radio mm -hmm. and, that by default, their 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 software allowed people to call in, so you were live mm -hmm. streaming. And then I I didn't like the sound because they they basically 
no matter how much nice radio equipment you had, mm -hmm. you had to, or studio equipment, I should say, you had to dial in through an interface into a phone, through a phone number. Yep. And so I would have $3,000 worth of equipment and it sounded like I was talking on a cell phone. And so I was <laughs> like, work. this is, I was like, this is kind of dumb. Like, it sounds like we're just recording a phone call. This is mm -hmm. way complicated. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, <clears throat> so, uh, I, I, I researched a few other options and I found mm -hmm. Spreaker. Yeah. Well, I went with Spreaker. They had a much more robust sort of sound and they could stream live, but I couldn't take live callers anymore. Mm -hmm. So I set up my own Skype account, paid extra, the extra account for a month, you know, per month. I think it was mm -hmm. like 12 bucks a month or something to be able to receive phone calls. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I had to bring in a producer mm -hmm. to take live calls. But to I was screen like, the calls. Yeah, to screen mean, calls, right. right. But but they couldn't do it sitting across from me in the studio. It couldn't be my co-host just taking calls. Right. Of course. So we started setting up a plan of how can we use Skype to take calls during a live show. And there were tons of message boards about it. There were tons of questions going, you know, how, how can, how can someone make this happen? How can you make, how can I take live callers using Skype without upgrading to their business account and all of mm -hmm. this? And nobody had it figured out. So I devised a plan, set the settings just right, basically cracked the code. And then I started doing live callers. Well, Spreaker themselves reached out to me and said, you're the only serve a show we know of that's able to take live callers through Skype on Spreaker. Will you do a tutorial about it? Hmm. And I was like, sure. So we set aside a whole day and filmed a tutorial and I made it funny and kind of branded it, you know, around my own thing. Yeah. And I made a video about it where you would basically, you would set your Skype up to auto answer a specific, um, uh, a specific account to auto answer every call that comes in. But the account is hidden. It's named very obscurely. Like nobody knows what it is. And you would call in one number. I was connected to another laptop into the mixer. And mm -hmm. that one always auto answered. Then I had the slider down. So it would say it would be on channel seven and the slider would be down at all, at all times. And my producer would sit across from me in studio and be a co-host. And when we would get a call, he would just take his laptop and walk out of the room. He would answer it. And then he would screen the call and go, yeah, hold on. And he would click transfer and it would just show up on this other screen for me and auto transfer. And so now he's transferred to me. I've got him on the line and all I got to do is slide up and he would type things to me in chat and be like, you have Dennis from Chicago mm -hmm. on, on line seven. And I'd be like, Dennis from Chicago on line seven. And, you know, we showed everybody how we did it shortly after I did that tutorial, it had thousands of views, Skype disabled their transfer feature to make people go upgrade to the business. Oh, I mean, of course. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the reason they did that because thousands of people were, <laughs> were cracking the code because of the video. And then, you know, they just disabled that feature, but uh, yeah, I don't do live callers anymore, but the, I know that's a long answer to your question, but for the first, no, it's fine. the first four and a half years of the show on Spreaker, because Spreaker did have a live broadcast functionality. I was broadcasting live and then through Spreaker, I got a deal with iHeartRadio. And iHeartRadio was live streaming me through there. And then I also got a deal, um, a syndication deal for five radio stations in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So for the first four and a half years, I was, uh, the, I say first four and a half years, I was live on Blog Talk Radio for the first year. The following four and a half years, you know, from years two to six and a half, I was broadcasting live through Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and... Um, five syndicated radio stations in the Midwest. And that was a blast. So I never had to edit at all. I was just going live on air. All my editing was, you know, building stuff beforehand. Right. And right. Then I would go live and the show would just have to go off without a hitch. So I'm doing live production and live hosting and everything at the same time. There was so much that went into it. But when I was done, I hit stop and left and everything auto went to iTunes and everything else. It just auto uploaded. And that was great. So, but yeah, that's how I was able to take live callers and be live on the radio from my house using the internet in 2011, 2012. I mean, yeah, that was super cool. That was one of uh, one of the walls you broke in, in addition to, uh, you know, having a podcast before people had a word to call it that. And then 
Uh, you also kind of monetized your podcast pretty early, right? Because you had your own website where people, I mean, I mean, you leverage what, uh, I think it was PayPal, right? I, I think I was a, a paying member for a while. Uh, and then you basically, you basically thought of Patreon before Patreon thought of Patreon, right? You had extra to content. Fair, to be fair, one of my listeners thought of it. Um, oh, I really? Met, uh, yeah, I was at a conference and I met, I was just doing it all for free. Uh, the only revenue I had was some, there was a little bit of ad revenue coming in, but I was a pretty small creator. I think I probably had, I don't know, four or 5,000 downloads an episode. It, it was it was very new. And I, I was at a conference giving a, giving a talk and I met this guy named Bill and he was a listener and he goes, hey man, if you ever have some sort of thing, some sort of monthly thing where I can sign up and, you know, like get rid of the commercials or get any extra stuff, you know, if you had a way for me to pay you, I'd love to sign up and support what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Bill, that's genius. Let me see what I can do. <laughs> and I left the next morning. I drove home and immediately started working on how can I have um, a, a login for my website. And I was an IT guy, but I was in, I was in architecture and development and mobile phones. I was not in uh, coding at all. I was not a code monkey. And so I went and found some code on the internet called Wishlist Member. I paid $99 for it. I pasted that down and built around it and sort of taught myself basic, ugly script and uh, had a basic shell of a website and then started asking listeners if there were any IT people out there that wanted to, to volunteer and help me. And uh, Philip Kaiser, who has been volunteering for Camp Quest and other sorts of great organizations said, yeah, I'll help you. I'm, I'm an IT uh, infrastructure guy. He joined me and the two of us built it together and we started charging using PayPal. And it was very primitive, very, very ugly, very basic Craigslist looking, you know, just lists of stuff. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely it started to come together. And yeah, it, it existed before Patreon did. And when I say I, I was able to quit my job and go full time in 2013, this was, I was not using Patreon. I was on right. my own platform. People were signing up to do PayPal. And basically, I would cut my show off at a certain time and say, you know, everything after the 90-minute mark is for patrons. Um, and people started signing up. And sometimes I would just do live streams for patrons. I would do Q – page they weren't patrons yet, but I would do live streams. We called them members or fourth listener members. Mm -hmm. And I would live stream and do that. And then when Patreon came along, I was like – I was kind of in the process of being contacted by seven or eight other podcasters going – can you put me on your platform? I want to earn money and you take a percentage. So I was kind of competition for Patreon, but I saw them and I was like, wait a minute. I, I, I found myself three or four times a week on the call with my IT guy mm -hmm. having to do server outages and server operating system upgrades and um, network card replacements. And I'm like, this feels like work again, right? Yep. This feels like I'm, I'm managing a server center. This feels like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the manager of an of 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 some sort of IT corporation. I don't right. want to be in the IT business. I want to create content. And this is I feel like I'm back in the So I started looking into Patreon. I got on the phone with them and I said, "Look, I'm basically your competition even though I'm microscopic. I've got seven podcasts that I'm currently managing, but I think I want to join you and give up on everything." And they said, "Yeah, we would like that very much." <laughs> so we negotiated a deal. I folded my business and I joined Patreon and now they handle all the password resets and I can't download this. And that doesn't stop people from asking me for help, but of course. I, I just tell them I don't manage that. Like Patreon right. handles all that. They set up the RSS feed. They manage literally everything. All I have to do now is create the content and put it out. And it, it's worth the percentage I pay them to do it uh, so that I can be in the content business, not the IT business. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally get that for sure. For sure. Um, one of the things I, I want to make sure that I get down to, and it was kind of related to the topic that we previously kind of touched on, was related to the call-ins uh, that you used to allow. But like, I mean, even your some of your guests, I mean, uh, Brian Fisher, I think comes to mind as a possible challenging audio editing, you know, like, how do you make that guy who's like, uh, you know, almost Alex Jones talking into his mic sometimes, uh, how do you make him or others sound good when, when they have no idea and you can't even coach them to get a, a good audio sounds uh, from the source? 
what I do is I make it part of the content. So Brian Fisher decided to join my show on a patio at night <laughs> with like birds like, chirping and like it was crickets i think <laughs> it was there so was loud crickets, constant crickets chirping yeah. and he's just out having a cigar and not even thinking about it and i as soon as we get on the show i'm like this is gonna be an audio nightmare uh -huh. so i just i just address the gorilla in the room i just go are those crickets like and and i leave <laughs> it in the show because i know that that's what people you know because if, if someone says let's go camping and they're on the same page and they're setting up the tent. The crickets aren't going to be irritating because you expect that going into it. But when you listen to a podcast, you don't expect there to be crickets in your ear during a conversation. So if you bring the audience into the situation and they understand your struggle, they empathize with you. They think it's funny. Everybody knows about it. And then we can move on. Mm -hmm. And I had Aaron Ra as a, a guest uh, he can get co host sometimes, huh? Oh, he was. <laughs> He was, he was a normalized nightmare because yeah. it wasn't that he just got loud. He was also the quietest person in studio. Mm -hmm. So he would literally be away from the mic. He'd take a drink of his beer and he would go, well, I mean, that's one of the things that we got to work on. <laughs> people believe the Bible. And oh. The Bible's an issue. And the problem is everything in the Bible is wrong. <laughs> oh my gosh. In the same sentence, he would shift and just go into heavy metal screaming. Oh, uh, you know, no more examples though are necessary. To be I know. Clear. I knew. I knew that when I did that, it was going to overmodulate for you. But you can fix it, and I can fix it before I, can. I send it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but but it's it's one of those deals where, rather than me focusing on hosting the show or having a good time in the conversation, I had to be like, speak up, come closer. Back uh -huh. off. Quit yeah. screaming. And rather than me being behind the scenes doing it, I finally just started going, Aaron, don't scream into the microphone. This isn't the WWE. Like, you're mm -hmm. not calling out Hulk Hogan. Back off the mic. And he would laugh, and I would laugh, and the people would laugh. And I remember distinctly, years ago, when I started naming my title, it would be like, so-and-so versus David C. Smalley in all the episodes. Someone said, my favorite verses is David C. Smalley versus Aaron's mic levels. <laughs> and I was like, okay, they're in on it. They get the joke. I've you know, called it out enough. And I think if you bring them into the fold, that kind of helps. Because some people, there's just no way to fix it. I mean, it's bad. And I did go to a studio one time that had a fix for that. They um, made their guests wear headsets. Yeah. So that, and the headset had a little mic on it. Because... You know, people who aren't used to being in a studio are terrible about talking into the mic and then turning their head to be like, oh, yeah, you were there. And yeah, you saw that, too. And the, oh, the, yeah. the, the Especially audio if there's just, more than one person in the room, right? Yeah, like, they turn their head because yeah. they're just not aware of where the, where their head needs to be. And so I'm, I find myself directing their head back to the thing and they're like, oh, sorry. But they'll be like this. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. It's like, yeah, ah, overcorrecting. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So, you know, it's a little bit of that and a little bit of kind of calling it out. Some people might get offended, though, you know, if you you bring up that that, you know, you need to talk into the mic. It throws them off because they thought they were in sales mode or they're talking about their book or whatever. And then you go come closer. They're like, oh, uh, and now that sounds great. But the content is gone. They're like, oh, right. uh, uh, anyway, I forgot the question. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta, you gotta weigh the risks, you know, and, and lastly, to answer this question, Isotope RX for my DAW has been a lifesaver. I don't know if you use it, but it is. I do. And, uh, the, the denoise that they have <laughs> is phenomenal and Man. the D clip as well, uh, way better. I don't know how deep, how technical you want to get on this show. Oh, I am into, incredibly into... technical nerd. Okay. The F out. Please go. All right. So let's do this. So, so, um, m any compressor that you have is going to add hiss. Uh huh. If it's a live compressor or if it's a post edit compressor, Sibilance there's going to be a, what they call it, like, yeah, yeah, right, especially. right. It's going to be a, right. And not just that, but even just a constant, a lot of the Right. Time. There'll be a constant hiss, but also it'll a emphasize the S's and all that. Right. And a DSer will not necessarily fix it if you've done a, yep. a large compression. Yeah. And if you Absolutely. try to denoise that in, Honestly, I'm sure there's somebody out there that does what RX does. I haven't, whether it's Pro Tools or even the free consumer stuff like Audacity, I, I've I've never found anyone that does a denoise quite like uh, 
are they doing the spectral this, denoise the spectral they, denoiser that's what i was about freaking to say amazing yeah. it is because the other one's just i don't know so if you i don't know how many people are going to listen to this that aren't audio nerds already but like it, it's if, an audio if, nerd podcast don't worry about it it's all right all cool so so when you so when you, if you were to record something in audacity mm -hmm. and there's a hiss going on Mm -hmm. And you can denoise that. You can select it and you can say, get rid of that hiss or whatever. I don't know what they call it anymore, but they get rid of it. The hiss is going to be gone from blank. But when you're talking, there's always going to be a sort of fuzzy hiss around all of the waveforms. So every time you yep. hear me speak, you're going to hear the hiss. And then when I stop, talk, stop talking, it'll go dead silent. RX... Uh, That's a gate, right? That's what you're talking about there. Right, right. Isotopes RX gets in the middle of all of it and gets rid of all of it completely. <laughs> so I don't use any compressors anymore. I use no compressor mm -hmm. and I do a little sound check for the show. And then at the end, what has really saved my life more than, more than the, the D noise is the D clip. Because if you just normalize, you know, it just, it's like yep. grading something on a curve. It only goes as high as the biggest thing, but with D clip, you can gain things beyond you know, zero dB. You can gain things off the charts. Right. And then within a certain range, you can declip down to something that's not going to be overmodulated. And so yep. if someone is talking at a you know, minus four dB and I'm at a 0.1, so I'm up here, they're down here. Yep. What I can do is I can, I can gain that up to where they are at you know, minus one dB and I'm plus six, but then I can declip myself down. And mm -hmm. it's a kind of a manual way of doing what a compressor could do, but it's so much better than any compressor I've ever heard do manually. Even yeah. boards that I've spent like two grand on that claim to be like the best at live compression, they just don't do it as good as you can do in post-production with Isotope RX. It's I totally amazing agree. software. Plus D verb is one of my favorite plugins. Uh, oh, the, like, the... You don't, you don't see my room, but it's basically uncoust uh, acoustically untreated. It's got like wood background. It's got tile in the back behind me. Um, I've got, I've got some, like, uh, I've got a drum shield, which I use as like a makeshift recording booth for my music and stuff. Uh, but, but I mean, I'm basically in a, in a not ideal room without acoustic treatment. So I can make it sound like basically flat audio and it's super helpful. Nice. The other thing I want to say about RX, I mean, I might as well rename this podcast or show the uh, the RX Seven Appreciation Hour or something because <laughs> literally, I've uh, after talking with you are the the I want to say sixth podcaster I've, I've spoken with, uh, and every single one of them are are using the RX suite. Are you on eight or seven? Uh, are you using? They surprise advanced? you. I'm still on three. Really? I, and here's why: I upgraded to six at one point, and I didn't like it. I didn't huh. like, I think I went with a smaller, a lower end and I had the Mac, whatever the biggest one is on, on, on RX three. And I right. just never, all I do is denoise any studio hiss or refrigerator clicks or dog bar. I just denoise all the crap right. out. And then I bring up the audio. I, I overmodulate to, to gain it out and then declip. And then I export it, and it won't export to MP3, which I think is the biggest fault of of, of Isotope in the RX3 version. But yeah. then I just save the file, open in Audacity, and and you know bounce it as an MP3 from Audacity. So that's how I do my podcast. I don't need to upgrade it because that's all I that's all I do with it. One of my questions was going to be, uh, "What's your G?" Oh wow, time check. We are we are at the time that you agreed to record. So I mean, do you have a few more minutes for me to yeah, ask no, a few I'm more fine. questions? I'm I fine. appreciate no, that. Thank you You're for fine. being so generous. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. Um, I, I wanted to ask if you, uh, let's see, I had a train of thought. Oh, what you used Audacity. I've heard you mention that several times. That's your DAW of choice. Has it always been? No, 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 no. Isotope. 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 Is the, yeah, is your Isotope DAW? That's what you record the audio on? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I uh, only do you use your DAW software or do you record directly in, in RX? I record directly in the RX. Interesting. That's yeah. the first that I've heard. Okay. Really? Yeah, I record you directly into I, The only thing I use Audacity for is for the MP3. Okay. I, I take a completely finished product down. in in RX, and then I export it as a wave. Yep. Open it in, open it in Audacity, and export it as an MP3. If they ever let me upgrade, you know, if there's any sort of plugin or something to be able to 
to bounce from RX3 to an MP3, I'll never need Audacity again. But yeah, I, 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 I record directly into, into RX. Uh, I am a, a giant nerd and would love to give you a free utility where you could literally drag and drop a WAV file you had exported from RX and convert it to MP3 in the same folder. Really? Would you like that? Let's well, connect uh, afterwards if, if okay. you want. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the, so I will say one more thing I just thought of as you said that, because if I actually consider doing that, um, if I need to cut any space or cut or, or uh, like cut the beginning out or like, you know, if I take a five minute break in between between the that, free show and the Patreon, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it takes it takes so long to bring everything. Together. Every cut takes a long time. I so I, I did lie a little bit. I will I will use Audacity for that because okay. it, yeah. when you cut yeah. it, it's instant, you know? So yeah, exactly. I, I may do – I just rarely edit anything out, but I will cut dead space out from the ends and from the middle. And so I still have to put it in Audacity for that. So, I yeah, I'll just keep Audacity for the MP3 exports. But that's still a good tool to have for sure. I get a little crazy with my editing. So I, I use a DAW to do things like I'll remove it when I say, uh, like this. Uh, and then I can remove that space from both of our audio streams simultaneously. It's called like a ripple editor or bubble editor or something like that. Okay. Handy stuff like that. And then I also do it to do like intro music and interstitials and bumper and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, uh, thanks for getting all nerdy and talking with me. Uh, I love I love the RX uh, suite for sure. Uh, I've not d done the RX eight upgrade yet. I have RX seven advanced, and like you, it gives me everything I need. Um, and um, you record directly into it? No, I record into Studio One. That's my uh, DW oh, okay. choice, uh, which is a PreSonus. Uh, PreSonus, know? yeah. I've yeah. used the PreSonus board where we use uh, Studio, Studio Live board. Yep. 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 I've heard good things. What did you think of the Studio Live board when you used it? I had a producer during that time, mm -hmm. so I literally paid him to learn it, and I okay. never had to be on the board. I was yeah. doing hosting, yeah. so I never really got into it. Uh, I liked the board, and then I ended up um, just getting rid of it. When we, I, I, I changed how I did my show. I changed the format right. and went back to a smaller setup but, yeah. uh, and, and started going into... I signed a couple of deals where I was going into studio, like with Podcast yep. One or with I remember that. or so, someone in LA. And then when I was doing it at home, I've got a, a Mackie you know, Pro FX, uh, I think a, a 12 V2 or something that I just use at home. And I just didn't need, mm -hmm. you know, with, 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 with the, with the post-production uh, availabilities with RX, I just didn't need the compressor. And it's a, it's a big board. I mean, it's a it's a big thing, and it's complicated. And if you don't have all the right things lit up, you're not gonna. I mean, it's it's designed for someone who is literally only doing that. Mm -hmm. I think if you are also hosting something and directing traffic, and y you don't want to manage that type of board, I don't think. If you have a dedicated producer, that's a great board to have, especially for live performances. But for a guy doing a podcast like this at home, it, it was overkill. So, mm -hmm. Did you like the studio podcasting experience when you were uh, when you were in downtown LA for what the few months I want to say before COVID like shut everything down? Well, I guess you went in there for a little bit after COVID, about, didn't you? It was about three years before. COVID. Was it that long? Yeah, I was. I signed a I signed a two year deal with Podcast One. The deal was up. We renewed for one year, and then I went and I was in I was in studio quite a bit with them. Huh. And that was in Beverly Hills. It wasn't in downtown. And then, and then I went to um, the comedy store with uh -huh. their network, and they have a studio in their basement. And I did yeah. a lot of shows out of there for probably, I'd say, six months to a year with the comedy store. And then I started with Starburns, and that's where it looks like I'm gonna go back when COVID lifts. Is back mm -hmm. in the studio with Starburns. I love the studio experience. I prefer the studio experience. Yeah. I like bringing three or four people in the studio. Uh, I, I like being in person face to face. I like having a producer through a glass window that doesn't know me that well that I get to interact with live during the show. Mm -hmm. I like bringing the behind the scenes people into the live show and pulling the curtain back. It's my, it's my style of broadcast. Mm -hmm. I like stopping everything when the, when you know, ninety-five percent of podcasters, when the glass falls over, they write a they write down the time code and go edit that out later. 
And I just go, oh, my God, he broke a glass. What happened? And during the <laughs> entire cleanup phase, we're talking about how ridiculous it is that we're having to clean up glass on the studio. I enjoy that type of radio when it happens randomly. And so I want to give that, that genuine experience to my listener. So some people may be turned off by that, but I, I love it. In fact, if I have something secret I need to say, if I want to say something to my co-host or to a producer, and I'll say, I think I know who you're mad at, the, the lady that works downstairs. Yeah, I don't want to say her name. I'll mute the mics and go through three or four names, and the listener just gets 20 seconds of dead air. You know, when we, when <laughs> we come back laughing out. laughing at the end. Yeah, and yeah. then they just get us laughing, and they're like, oh, you bastard. Yeah. You know, I could easily go cut that out. But why? You know, I want them to I... experience that. So uh, to me, you know, people can go back and listen to guys like Russ Martin. Very mm -hmm. few people probably know who he is. He's a local Dallas radio guy. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I love doing. He's like a local version of a Howard Stern. Okay. It's just very, it's just very real, very crude. Fights happen on air, arguments happen on air, things get broken, they burp, they fart, they open out the bottles of alcohol. You can hear people swallowing. You can hear them set the, you know, the cup down. They take a drink. Mm -hmm. You get that sound in studio. I love that stuff. It feels genuine. It feels real. And, and it's like the, the NPR thing. episode that opens with someone opening a car door right as they walk up to do the interview. Exactly. That's, 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 that's the kind of that's I puts love you that in the kind moment. Of stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, that's one of the things I like about your show, too. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, we do have a, a bit of a lightning round. Uh, okay. Let's try to squeeze that in. Uh, so let me pull up my little... I, I, I'm actually trying to literally datatize this and, like, uh, and chart it on my site. So let me pull up my... I have a form I fill out. I'm going to give you like a finite set of responses. I, I need you to choose from one or the other because there's no text box for me to type other. Uh, the point of the lightning round, for those who don't know, uh, is that like if you go to the, the music store or the audio store or ask an audio expert, uh, if that gold plated like super awesome cable with the tr super triple ultra shielding is worth the 600% markup over that other cable, uh, they are always, almost certainly, uh, that, that it is uh, certainly worth that money. But I'm not sure that's true, at least in my experience. So I wanted to get your take on it, uh, David. Are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Um, is it worth the money to buy a fancy, unbalanced quarter-inch patch cable? That'd be something like a speaker cable or a uh, guitar cable, if you're not familiar Probably not fancy, but also not the cheapest. I think the high to mid grade is probably the best way to go. They all go out eventually. Uh, I think I like the Magnum. Your choices are cool. worth it or waste of money. Oh, you want me to get quick then? Uh, I do. Lightning round. Uh, and we're talking money. gold plated connectors, super ultra shield. No, stuff waste like of that. money. Waste, waste of money. money. Okay, cool. Is it worth the money to buy fancy balanced quarter inch patch cables? That is a, a nice uh, speaker cable or uh, mixing uh, connecting cable. Uh, waste of money. Waste of money, yeah. Oh, uh, XLR cable. Any, any difference there? I mean, I hate these binary options here. I always go mid grade. I, I don't want people to get the idea of going cheap. So I waste of money for the big gold plated expensive one, though. For sure. Cool, cool, cool. Um, is it worth money to buy an external preamp if you're starting a podcast with like a cheap audio interface? No. No, waste of money, okay. Um, is it worth the money to buy third-party plug-in hardware processors? I, I, I'm going to say worth it based on your isotope review. <laughs> but no. y yes. Okay. Well, um, is yes. It, oh, but... Okay. But uh, we'll let you hatch I, afterwards. Okay. <laughs> uh, is it worth the money to buy dedicated streaming hardware like a, a StreamYard or a Sling Studio? You may not be a streamer, so I, I understand if you have I'm no not, idea. but I'll say yes. I think that's where the market's going, so yeah. Cool. Uh, is it worth the money to buy a green screen if you're doing live streams? Mm, no. Waste of money. Cool. Please. Please let me explain this later. Waste of I will. I will. We will let you hedge all, all to your desire. Uh, your digital audio workstation you said earlier was Audacity, so I will go over that no, one. No, no, Isotope RX. I, well, okay. So, but that's not what you use to like make edits and like interstitial stuff, right? Which is what I would classify DAW as. That's so unfair. 
ninety percent uh, of all of my stuff. In lightning arguments. round argument. Lightning round. Lightning argument. round argument. Yeah. I don't, okay. I, I something else. It. I'll put you down for something else, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Because okay. uh, Isotope was a curveball, I think, as I said yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you stream anywhere? Like a and a or anything like that? And if so, what's okay. your streaming solution? Occasionally just YouTube. Uh, StreamYard. Yep. Yeah, StreamYard and YouTube. You use StreamYard. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, do you have a preferred software that you use for conferencing, like a uh, restream, a Zencast, or a Zoom, a Skype, a Teams, whatever? Skype. Skype. Cool. Um, your preferred restreaming service, if you have to like stream to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Do you have one? I don't, I don't do that, no. Cool. Um, do you use any of your Audacity's uh, stock plugins like EQs, compressors, anything like that to do a no. final mix down? No, absolutely. No. Um, you, I already know your answer to the I, uh, Isotope RX is a suite of cost-effective tools to get an audio broadcast ready and repair problems. Strongly agree? Can I put you down for strongly, strongly agree? Strongly agree, <laughs> absolutely. I'm in the Isotope camp. Uh, do you use Isotope Ozone at all, which is like a mastering uh, toolkit? No. Okay. Oh, wait. Hold on. Yeah? Mm. It says Ozone on it. I don't know that I use that piece. Okay, cool. I'll put you down yeah. for neutral. Um, you ever use the Fab Filter set of plugins before? No. Or heard of it? No. Uh, Waves plugins, you use those? What do you mean? Uh, there's a company called Waves. They, they make oh, a lot no. of plugins. No, no, cool. no, no. Gotcha. Um, and then you already said I Isotope is your manufacturer's plugins uh, name. If you're willing, um, could you ballpark what you what you pay a year or month to like host your your domains, your websites, your your uh, RSS feeds, and, and anything else, um, just so people can get an idea of like how you could get an entry level podcast on, on the air? Well, are we still in the lightning round? I mean, we are technically, but if you're not willing to share a lightning uh, version, then we can skip over it. That's cool. Uh, hold on. Let me, I would say uh, total costs 500 a month. Cool. Wow. Thank you for sharing, by the way. Not everyone does. Um, you are... Uh, you are beating me in terms of podcasts per dollar per month. I think. <laughs> um, do you uh, do you record more material in general than a target show duration? It target sounds like show. maybe like what you if you're if you have an hour long episode? show, you're trying to make an hour long show. Do you record like a little overtime so you can cut stuff out? Or it sounds like you actually kind of straight the other way. You kind of go live, for lack of a better word. I just do as long as the conversation is genuine and then I release whatever we record. I don't. Do that. Thank you, David Smalley. Awesome. Uh, so hedge go. <laughs> you okay. To... God, which one, yeah. where are we going to start? So on the money first, let's start with the most recent. Yeah. So, so, um, I, when I first started with Spreaker, they wanted me to give them, you know, just upload and it went straight to iTunes and that's what I did. Uh huh. And then when I signed my deal with Podcast One in Beverly Hills and they wanted to move me out to, to L.A., uh -huh. I realized I didn't own any of my stuff. Like, it was all Ooh. just sitting on Spreaker. And I was, I was like, well, if I'm going to have to start over with a new network, mm -hmm. what if I end up leaving Podcast One after a year or two? I don't want to start over again. So I sat down with my same IT guy that's been with me from the beginning, Philip, and... I was like, let's, let's build our own thing. And whatever network I sign with, we can just do a, I think it's called a 303 or a 30, some kind of redirect that he handles. And we just redirect through their network mm -hmm. so that we don't have to lose all of our iTunes subscribers again. And so that's what I did. So I have probably a little more expense because, um, I, I have, uh, I have these set of servers that I rent out. You have Where this legacy every, cost to redirect from your old show to your new show, basically, is what you're talking about, right? Well, it's it's more it, it's 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 redirect. So, so you have iTunes subscribers, mm -hmm. and they were all going straight to Spreaker, and then I was uploading to Spreaker. So when I leave Spreaker and come over here to Podcast One, 
I have to re get all of my subscribers again. And, and that's like, right. you know, you're, if you're a podcaster, subscribers are your number one source of everything, right? They're your ad revenue. That's how you customer acquisition. It's literally everything. So number of um, downloads a month, I think is the key metric to get an ad, right? Right. So everything. So, so I now have my own system where iTunes is pointing at my system, not anybody else. You have so your own server to, Spreaker, to track the statistics. Yeah. Yeah. So when I go to Spreaker, then Spreaker redirects to my thing. And if I go to a podcast one, they redirect to my thing. If I sign a new deal with Starburns, then I'm a Starburns podcast, but they're going to redirect to my server. Sure. So nothing's ever just uploaded to them. It's uploaded to me and directed to them, or I upload to them, but the downloads are all redirected back to my server. So that way the iTunes subscribers, and not even just iTunes, any Podbean, any right. any podcast app that you use that you're subscribed to me on, you're connected to my server. Because and, they all allow you to put your analytics URL in there. Is that right? Is that what you're talking about? It's not just that. It's, 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 I don't want to break the link to the subscribers. Mm -hmm. So, so if I, you know, like right now I'm on Spreaker. If I say, Hey, I want to, you know, someone else offers me a deal and, and they want to pay me an upfront amount. They, Hey, we'll give you $50,000 to shift networks and we'll give mm -hmm. you 85% of your revenue instead of 65% or 70%, right? And you negotiate and get offered a better deal because your downloads are higher. Then I want to be able to make that shift and not say, ah, now I have to, I'm starting a brand new podcast from scratch. Nobody wants to keep starting over. So mm -hmm. now within about an hour and a half, I can make a phone call to Philip and we can change whatever network I'm on and I lose no subscribers. So, nice. so I would recommend doing it that way. It is a little more complicated, a little more stressful, but when you actually get ready to shift, you don't feel locked into to somebody's deal. Um, so technically speaking, do you have like a cloud RSS server? Is that how you're managing that basically? Yes. Yeah. Through DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We use DigitalOcean. Sorry, server writing space. that down because that's, yeah. I'm a nerd and I want to research it. <laughs> yeah. It's spelled like I think it is, uh, yep. not like dropping at vowels nope. for no reason nope. for internet right. speak. Right. <laughs> okay, cool. cool. Uh, awesome. That's a that's a very interesting little bit. Like, you've got so many cool insights because you've b basically been around like as this whole medium uh, came into being. Uh, so it's been super interesting to to chat with you. You've been very generous with your time, and I appreciate that. Um, I guess I have. One final question. About, okay, before no, you, you ask your final gotta, question, and I'm, I'm not yeah. in a hurry to get. I'm not in a hurry to get out of here. Um, uh, I, so I just, I, I just received a notification. I was waiting on a, um, a callback for a, a, an audition. Um, I had a callback, uh, and I was put on a veil for a Super Bowl commercial, and I just got the text that I did not get it. So now screw them. I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just not going to get that commercial. Um, but uh, I, I. Um, I want to talk about the, the, the DAW situation. So yeah. um, I guess I use the way I can describe it is I record directly into to Isotope RX. Uh -huh. And then immediately when I hit stop, I hit save. Uh -huh. Give it a name. Now I've got the content. I go in and gain, declip, gain, declip, gain, declip three times. And that brings oh, me oh, up to sorry. a really... What I, I hate to interrupt. Are you multi-track recording and uh, isotope? No. Or you're okay. So you're recording the stereo mix of you and your guest talking. Mono. Mono mix. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess Mon that makes sense. You're both talking yeah. to mics, right? So. Yep. Yep. And it has to be mono when it's done. And so if I record stereo, I'm adding a step in post I right. have to break it apart. So. Um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. It started raining, and I'm in LA. That never happens. I'm like, what's hitting the window? Oh, it um, might also be some background noise. My wife is finishing dinner no. for my two young kids, which is why, oh. by the way, my defense for forgetting that it had been so long, like the three years felt like a few months to me. It's because I've I've had a, a kid since then. So, oh, wow. <laughs> congratulations, that's cool. Oh, um, so yeah, I um, uh, I I do I do the gain declip, gain declip, gain declip, and that brings the bottom audio up 
all the hissing, all the refrigerator buzzing. And mm-hmm. then I do the denoise. I found if you do the denoise before you raise it up, it doesn't catch some stuff. Yeah. So I bring up the audio first, then I do the denoise. I usually have to do that two or three times because it'll be a little modulated, weird breath and stuff. I do that a few times and then have a really clean, crisp, sort of a mastered file before I edit, if that makes sense. Like you would think you do editing and then master, but I do it the opposite. I master the audio, I bring up the levels, I make it sound really nice and clean. And then I take that file and save that as a wave and export it out. Then I open Audacity and I cut off the end. I cut off the beginning, I cut off the end, I cut the space out of the middle, and I export it. So I'm, I'm in Audacity, honestly, for a minute and a half. And I'm in Isotope for close to an hour. So to say that Audacity is my DAW feels Oh, dirty. gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. But, but yeah, if I did need to cut something, I would, I would go do it in Audacity. So that's why I, I te- technically I know that... You're right, but I don't feel comfortable latching myself to Audacity because it's honestly just an export tool for me in case I do need an an edit. But I, I hardly ever that makes need sense. An edit, so, so like, do you have the intro music that plays at the beginning of your show? Do you have like a soundboard or like a, a keyboard basically that has those samples loaded that you're hitting it to like record it uh, on the, on the live recording, or is that something you add in Audacity? I play it live through iTunes. Okay. Yeah. Like I just, I just, and then you got the output of your iTunes map to make it so the guests can hear it and like, uh, and all right. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just with anything with like, like that. Mm-hmm. Can you hear that? No, I can't. You can't. No, oh, I've got it mapped to you and I'm here. Oh, it's because it's coming in here so I could record my audio for you. Damn. Every other thing I've ever done, you'd be able to hear that because it's all the same USB audio. Well, normally you're the host. Yeah. The tables have turned, my friend. <laughs> the tables yeah. have turned. It's coming out of here instead of in the system. Damn. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I, I, I just play it right here in, in iTunes and I have uh, – that's what I love about the Mac E Pro FX is that it's just plug and play. I mean, it's so easy. You just pop it mm-hmm. in USB and – it's the in and the out, and it's just – it's so smooth. It's so easy. Before I got that, when I had a 1402 analog mm-hmm. mixer, yep. I had the um, – what's that? Personas a Focusrite mm-hmm. um, USB Focus audio right interface. Scarlet uh, or Personas? Scarlet, yeah. Scarlet. Yeah, Focusrite Scarlet. Yeah, Scarlet. yeah. yeah, yeah. Fo- sorry. Yeah, Focusrite. No, no worries. Personas – Personas makes the Firebox, the uh, the Studio Live mixers. They make the, uh, the okay. So I have the Persona Studio and Live and the Scarlet. Um, this was a lot. It was a this red was box, box, right? Red box. The red box. The yeah, Scarlet focus, uh, right? two i two i two. I think focus. Yeah, right? I tried that one out for sure. Yeah, so I, I had that as my USB audio interface plugged into the fourteen oh two, and it was such a nightmare because when something would go wrong, it's like there's so many different levels of where is the you know the troubleshooting problem. It was just a nightmare. So upgrading to, you know, again, I think every mixer now almost that anyone's going to buy is going to have the USB built in. And these young kids just don't know how good they have it. You know, we used to have to jump through hoops back in my day. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I've had to, I've had to figure out many a problem. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a PC user on top of that. So I get to deal with like, I... audio problems and like audio routing problems and all that. But um, I'm shocked. I, I so I was an IT guy for PC, and I had so many problems constantly. My thought was, I know how to tear these computers apart and put them back together. So that's what I'm going to keep in my studio. Yeah. And then I kept having so many damn problems with PC and the audio routing issues and the yeah. how many applications want to take exclusive control of each device you plug in, and by default they check their own boxes. And I, I got so tired of it. I went and bought a Mac, I plugged everything in, and it just worked. And I went years without any problems at all in the studio, and I was like, I'll never go back to PC. Like, Mac is just so much easier to work with when it comes to audio production. So, For I've anyone so who has a, a bingo card filled out, we could just, like, like you might have the perfect bingo card. I'll finish it off for you here. So uh, so I'll, I'll be the uh, RME Audio Interface Appreciation Show now instead of Isotope Appreciation. RME has, has their own driver. Uh, basically, every audio interface you buy for Windows uses a Texas Instruments driver to interface with your computer which is why it's limited in terms of latency and also routing capabilities. 
RME uh, is a company, a, a manufacturer out of, like, I think Germany, that um, makes some nice high-end uh, uh, interfaces. I have a baby face, that's what we're talking on now. Uh, but they have their own drivers. They're the only company that wrote their own driver. And their mixer allows me to do things like loop back, which you can do pretty easily on Mac. That is almost impossible to do on Windows without uh, an RME or something similar. So uh, super, super awesome uh, interfaces. Um, was, were there any other hedges that you wanted to make? Uh, I uh, forgot. On your... It doesn't okay. matter. I, yeah. I'll, I'll remember when I'm sleeping and wake um, up and go, ah, oh, damn it. I didn't uh, tell him about this thing. Uh, stairwell wisdom. Uh, there's a French <laughs> word for it. I forget what the word is, but um, <laughs> um, please uh, do plug your social media sites. I'll link them all in the show notes, of course. But uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm David C. Smalley on everything. So David C. Smalley dot com, <laughs> David C. Smalley Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's even on TikTok. All David C. Smalley. So sweet. Um, I guess to close, I do like to ask, um, basically I have, I have three or four categories of guests and, and as a, a podcaster slash audio engineer, my last question for you is, uh, can you tell me the funniest story from, from a live show that, that you've done? I'm going to ask for, for you since uh, you do have a lot of live experience. Oh man. So... God, there's been a lot because I used to play country songs of the week, crazy songs <laughs> of the week. I and remember I would, that. <laughs> not just live, like live in front of 300 people at a conference live. Mm. Um, I had one, I was in Omaha, Nebraska one time and Neil deGrasse Tyson was there and it was like two o'clock in the morning and I was still on stage because it was Neil deGrasse Tyson and then me. Mm -hmm. oh, like anybody's wow. going to stick around for me after Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he starts running long during his talk. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there watching his talk and I'm like, watch it. And I love him, but I'm looking at my watch and I'm like, it's, he was supposed to wrap up at like 11 and it's like 1240. And I'm like, oh God, this is not going to be good. And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm going long. Is there anything in this room after me? And everyone collectively go, no! Oh, like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that hurts. Um, and so by the he, he just kept on talking and had a great time and the people loved it. And then he went to an after party and I got on stage around like 145 or so. So it was like 2.30 in the morning. There was like eight people in the crowd. Mm. And Neil had been on my show before. He had called in and we did a, a thing mm -hmm. I uh, remember. over the phone. And we'd also had a little fight over email that I misunderstood and was completely my fault. And I had to apologize to him when I brought him on the show. So we had this weird history of like being uncomfortable and then also friendly. So we had a cool bond, but he also knew I'd, I'd been an asshole before. So it was really bizarre. And at like 2.30 in the morning, Lawrence Krauss comes into the room, sits up on stage with me. We talk for a few minutes. He leaves. And as he's leaving, it's literally approaching 3 a.m., Neil comes out into the main arena from the party and comes up on stage. And he's, he goes, you want to do a show? And there's eight people in the crowd. And I'm thinking, <laughs> why, why would he want to? And I go, yeah, I sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he comes up on stage, but he's eating shrimp from the, <laughs> from the after party. So he's, he's eating. I'm broadcasting live on air. Plus, we have video going. So there's video of this, by the way. You can go to uh, youtube.com slash David C. Smalley Clips, and he's he's one of the he's he's eating shrimp, and as he's talking, he's, he's looking at me this way, and I'm I'm over here, and he's talking, and I'm seeing chunks of shrimp just like stick to my microphone as he's talking, and I'm like this this is disgusting, but it's Neil deGrasse Tyson. So what, what are we gonna what are we gonna talk about? And you have. Neil deGrasse Tyson at 3 a.m. all to yourself in front of a massive audience of eight people. What do you what do you talk to him about? And I was giving a talk the following day in the same room on whether or not tacos are sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And I had gone really deep with it. I don't want to ruin it because it's on YouTube and it has a special little twist at the end. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like a comedy stand up comedy slash presentation slash meaningful message all wrapped up into one. But, I, you know, I've got Neil deGrasse Tyson on stage. So rather than talking to him about, you know, interplanetary systems or whatever, 
I just started arguing with him about whether or not a taco was a sandwich. And <laughs> I, we just fought about that for like 45 minutes. And it's one of the best times I've ever had on a live show, even though very few people were there to witness it. So that's one of the first memories that comes to me when you ask me about live shows and having a good time. <laughs> a, a great story. Wow, David, thank you so much for joining me today. I super appreciate it. I feel like we could talk. Well, at least I could talk to you for hours. I don't know about you. Uh, but I mean, I, I'd love to, to connect again if you're open to it at some point. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it was great. So you've been very generous with your time. And I, I thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. I've had a good time. Again, like I said, I love talking about stuff that's not related to my podcast, too. So this is the first time I've ever got to just, like, geek out with someone about audio stuff. So I, I appreciate you having me. Anytime. Anytime. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. This was really fun. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Yeah.